Yeah, so we're good to go, I guess. So hi everyone, welcome to DEFCON CZ 2022 for the first session of the Room 1 Saturday. And let me welcome here our first speaker, Andre Lichtner. Uh, if you have any questions for our speaker, please use the Q&A section you'll see in Happen. We'll get to the questions at the end of the talk. Thank you and the floor is yours, Andre. Thank you. So, as was said, my name is Andre Lichtner. Uh, I work for Red Hat, specifically for the networking services team, which employs a number of people that work directly on the kernel uh, networking stack or related technologies, and they're you know, very intelligent developers. Me specifically, not that smart, so I just do automated network testing for them and handle infrastructure. Uh, so. We have a completely integrated pipeline for that. And this talk is going to be about one small part of that, which is a framework for writing network tests that we have created for that, uh, that use. So first of all, what is the problem that we are trying to solve? Uh, you mentioned network testing. Uh, it's a little bit different than your traditional testing when you think about software development. Uh, it typically involves, or what our situation is, it involves multi-host uh, testing. And that gets that can get very difficult sometimes because you need to interact with real servers. Uh, and because you are doing kernel development, as I've mentioned, you are oftentimes also rebooting the systems and reconfiguring stuff uh, in a quite complicated fashion. So when you start doing that, or if you start thinking about how to do that, uh, you know you can try doing manually by hand, configuring everything yourself, then running some kind of, kind of a benchmark. At some point, you may want to automate this via a shell script. Um, but because you are doing development uh, and you don't really want to run the development kernel on your also development machine, you want to do this remotely. So you start creating some basic test harness over SSH to distribute everything and to curl, control everything. And you still end up with a bunch of unresolved problems. Most of these are, you know, you need to, it is very difficult to actually synchronize your test hosts uh, and their individual actions. You need to handle uh, distributing logs or your tests uh, into the machine properly and a bunch of other stuff. So because I'm not very good at bash, uh, we decided to actually do something smarter and implement our own framework, uh, which we call Linux Network Stack Test, or LNST for short. It's a Python framework. It's uh, also a multi-host, multi-process application, and it's also a test repository. So everything is hosted on uh, GitHub on, on the specific link. I did upload the slides to the schedule, so you may want to click on that there later on. Now. What I mean by Python framework is that this is, you know, it allows you to write network tests in a nicer way than just doing bash scripts. Multi-host, multi-process application is what actually executes those tests so that uh, it provides you some sort of a harness. And test repository is that all of the tests that we develop and use uh, at Red Hat for our integrated pipeline are actually hosted, hosted directly on the Git project uh, that is listed here. So you may want to look at that if, if you want to. Before I actually start uh, getting into details, there are three main disclaimers I need to talk about. First of all, because we are doing configuration of networks, everything requires root permissions everywhere. And because we are distributing test code uh, over network, the project is basically a remote code execution uh, security hazard. So don't run this on anything you care about. Uh, and you know, be careful if you do anyway. Second, releases and packages. Uh, you may find RPM packages or a PyPy package for LNST. These are very out of date right now because a lot of the stuff that I will be talking about is uh, is new implementation, and we went through a bunch of redesign and reimplementation. And me, as the maintainer of the project, was very lazy and don't like RPM packaging or any sort of packaging at all. So these are out of date still. Finally, we are working with networking, so we inherited a lot of problematic language. Uh, so in this presentation, I'm going to be using uh, better words, uh, but uh, in the actual implementation of the project, you may encounter a lot of problematic language. We have a colleague working on this actively right now, but it is not finished, so we are working on it. Now, 
the architecture of what LNST actually is. This is a screenshot that I digged out from a very old wiki page, but it is still valid. The basic idea is that you have a multi-process, uh, multi multi-host application that runs on multiple servers. So you have your controller machine. This is typically where you would be doing your development and where you want to run your actual test. And then you have your test machines that actually run your test code. We show here that there are two networks here, the green and the red one. The green one works as your remote management network. So this is what you use to uh, manage the power settings of your machines, to reboot them remotely, etc. You use this also to provision your machines. And then LNST reuses this to communicate between its applications. Then the red network is what is actually used for your testing. So this is dynamic and uh, you reconfigure it uh, all the time and it is running all of your network uh, testing. Um, it is important to have it separated because you know if you're bringing devices up and down, your controller and LNST agent would get disconnected. So you know you need to have a stable network for that communication setup. It is also a good idea to have your test network completely isolated from everything else because we are going to be running performance benchmarks, which you don't want to get uh, noisy due to other traffic happening on your network, or on the other hand, your, net your performance benchmark impacting normal users of the network. The other idea uh, that, or the other part of the architecture for LNST is the concept of the test recipe, which we'll be talking about in this talk. The test recipe is a sort of extension to what a test is. It defines not only the test procedure that you want to do, uh, but also the configuration of your network and the physical requirements for your network. So we may have a lab that is very large with regards to the network, but one of our tests only requires two machines. So there is no need to reserve the entire uh, reserve the entire lab. So your test recipe uh, specifies what specifically it requires and honesty reserves that for you and uses only the resources that it needs. Okay, so for, I mentioned recipes changed and that's the new thing that I want to talk about. So a little bit of history. We started with recipes in XML form, which is shown in this, uh, this screenshot, there are two parts of it. There's the description of the network topology and its configuration and the actual test. So the test is just a ping connection check between the two hosts. And the reason for this was that we wanted to describe the network topology via as a, as, as a graph, which nodes and links between them made sense. So, and there is a standard to use uh, to do XMLs for describing graphs. So we did this. It was not very good for actually coding the test procedure. So we moved to the second version where we split off the test procedure into a Python file and uh, had that here. But this still leaves a lot of issues with just having to synchronize and link these two files together. And main problems with this for us was maintaining the test set that we have created. It, it got very large and we had a lot of duplication and it wasn't very easy to maintain due to, due to the limitations of how the recipes were written. So the new thing that we are using right now is uh, tests or test recipes that are completely written in Python, such as this. All of these three examples are the same. They require just the two machines that are connected directly back to back with one network. Uh, and you can configure one IP address on each of them and you run a pink, pink connectivity test between them and you just execute it with the recipe. So what are the actual features of LNST and why is it a good idea to use it? Um, going from simple to complex of what you can do, you start with the basic requirements of what you need to do to create a recipe. That is, uh, you describe the network requirements, the topology, what the hardware looks like, basically. You have to define your test method and you can optionally provide parameters. So we just saw that in the Hello World example. Uh, but after that, LNST provides you with abstractions for network device configuration we, via the LNST devices package. Uh, this is connected or this runs directly on your test machines and it connects over Netlink to your kernel to configure everything. Uh, you get test modules, which are basically Python classes of uh, test code that has some shared common functionalities that you want to distribute to your test machines and run it there. So these get dynamically sent to everywhere you need them to be. 
Uh, you can, of course, use recipe inheritance uh, because you are in Python, so it, all of that works nicely, which makes our life very uh, a lot easier to just maintain our test code and uh, everything else. And we are developing the recipe common module, which contains classes that are either mixins or extensions to recipes, which we found as common patterns in our test set that we think may be useful uh, to just share. So. I do have a demo stage to this because I think some of this stuff may be easier to just show you. Uh, so if I go into the terminal, hopefully everyone can read this fine. Uh, we checked before the start of the uh, talk. So this is the example uh, that you just saw, uh, you just saw uh, as the hello world. We described the requirements. This is the description of the physical part of the network. So you described that you want two host requirements. You could parameterize them if you wanted to. And you described that you want a device on each of them. And to indicate that these two devices can talk to each other, you add a label. This is the only required part of this description. Everything else can get dynamic with regards to how you want to describe your network. And you have your test method, which uh, in here you get the real representation of what machine uh, you got. Uh, so you have a special object for matched uh, objects. And in here, you get proxy objects that transfer all of your actions to your test machines. So this code is actually running on your controller. Uh, but every time you execute uh, any action here, that gets transferred to your test machine uh, if required. So the first first or easiest thing to do is to add IP addresses. And then finally, you run a command. This simply runs uh, a shell command, as you see it uh, here. Now, this part here, uh, this file, this demo script, is both the definition of the test recipe as well as an executable uh, Python script that, ru uh, that runs it. It has a little bit of a boilerplate code that uh, may not be uh, easy to understand or read. The basic idea is that in here, we just set up the controller instance, and we set it up in a specific way so that I don't have to interact with the real network or real test machines. Instead, the entire network that I described that I require for my recipe gets created with, uh, with Pod Podman containers. After that, I create an instance of the recipe, and I just run it. And uh, when that finishes, I print some summary with regards to what the results were. So if I go here, uh, I run this. And again, remember, I mentioned everything needs to run on root permissions. So I need to execute this with a uh, sudo. And if I do this, it's going to go through a couple of stages, which I'm going to describe from uh, the logs. You see a lot of errors here. This is because we are running with uh, containers. These are basically information errors for us right now uh, because these are trying to retrieve information about our hardware. But because we are in containers, there is no hardware to uh, retrieve information about. So if we go back to the start, we there is a uh, first stage of the recipe is to find a matching configuration or matching network. Uh, so we look for a subgraph in a graph that is available. Um, now, because we're running with containers, that gets created dynamically. And we get a description of what was uh, the match that was used. We do some basic pre-test machine cleanup and restoring some system configuration. We would get some hardware information if it was available. and. After that, we start with the actual test. Now, because I zoomed in a little bit too much, uh, this is wrapped uh, due to the length of the line. But what you should be seeing here is that you're calling device methods that are configuring the IP addresses here. And finally, you are starting a job here, which would be your pink test. So all of that gets executed. At it, and at the end, you get a cleanup of the configuration. Everything gets restored. And you get a summary of what was done. And you see that you had a ping, which past, whatever that means right now. Uh, and the overall result is, again, a pass. So I have a second a script or a second demo, which introduces uh, the additional features that Honesty gives you. Now, I mentioned recipe inheritance. So this time, I'm writing a demo to recipe. But instead of uh, basing this on our base recipe class, I'm basing this on my first demo recipe. Uh, which means that I don't have to any longer describe the requirements because I'm using the same ones. I could change them, but I don't have to. And I'm also adding an additional uh, class, which is our proof recipe uh, 
common module from the recipe common. And this provides us with some additional mixing uh, methods that help us write performance recipes. So our second uh, recipe uh, doesn't describe the requirements of the network, and it also doesn't describe the configuration network because we are reusing this from our parent class. After that, we just add the performance test action here. This is inherited from our perf, uh, perf recipe. And uh, it requires some configuration to know what the performance test should be. So this is a very, you know, it looks like a very complicated uh, construct for this, but typically this is connected into the back end of your recipes where everything, all of this gets generated uh, dynamically. The basic idea is that you specify how many times you want to repeat the performance test and you specified what me measurements you want to have done. We want to have an hyper flow measurement done and it should measure one flow, which is going to be a TCP stream between our two uh, IP addresses between the two uh, machines and it's going to take 10 seconds and that's it. Additionally, we are going to use this report and evaluate action, uh, which is going to take a look at the performance results from the performance test and tell us something about them. Uh, I do have a bug in the code that I found during making uh, while making this presentation, and I do need to specify this method here as an empty blind spot for it so that it doesn't crash. Uh, so I'm going to fix that after the presentation, but it's it's uh, not a big deal. Now I did one more thing here. I configured the summary formatter to give me one more level of detail while while printing everything. So. Uh, the summary here is going to look a little bit more in depth. So if I run this thing, uh, the start of the recipe is the same uh, as we have inherited that from the parent recipe. Now, at some point, it's going to start the performance test, which you should see here now that it started an iperf server and an iperf client. Now this takes 10 seconds to measure something and it's going to uh, now it finished here, and it's going to do that again because we specified two iterations for it. So it started the same thing again. And once we finish, we get a nice summary. Um, we should here see now, because we added one more level of detail, we now see the configuration actions that we have taken. So we also see the summary print us information about the configuration. Uh, the pink test that we've done uh, now shows us that it retrieved also information about what the pink did. So this is the standard output of everything. And then we have the actions of measurement. So iperf serves, iperf clients running. And because we called the uh, report and evaluate, it will also tell us what the actual measurement results are. So we see some numbers measured here. And uh, it also includes the raw data of everything. So this is how everything was parsed during the measurement. So you could print out a nice graph from this that shows you what the flow was while everything was running. So with that, the demo should be pretty much finished. So I'll just finish up the presentation. I talked about how we do this, in, or I wanted to talk about how we use this in Red Hat. So we built an entire recipe set, uh, which we call uh, Early Network Regression Testing, or ENRT. Uh, this uses the performance package we just saw. We start with a base ENRT recipe clause that we in, in implemented in a way that it combines a complex combination of scenarios that define or describe the basic topology of various software devices uh, and how these are configured statically. But then we combine a number of mixing classes that do smaller uh, system configuration parts that can be looped over to create a very large matrix of tests. So an example would be configuration of device interrupts or offload settings for various device uh, or network cards, etc. Now, everything, all of this measures performance, as you just saw, and internally we have it connected to a measurement database where we track the history of all of the performance measurements and the performance report and evaluate method that we called to show us our results. We'll also call, uh, call an automated evaluation code in there that will compare it to an older baseline result and tell us if it pass or failure based on that. Extra features that you kind of saw he here uh, that LNST supports is that you can work with virtual machines and LNST will create a dynamic network topology for you automatically. However, you are limited to the virtual machines that you are running on your own laptop. So those are created, those are static that you have pre-set up yourself. 
What you just saw was uh, an initial support for dynamic creation of containers to run recipes. It has some limitations right now, which weren't visible in the demo. It's not able to do more complicated network topologies, but we are working on that. Uh, I did mention test machine pool matching, so you, I, I did explain that. And the code that you are running on your test machines gets dynamically distributed to your test machines. So the recipe itself and uh, log collection and everything is running on your controller machine. And this is also where you have all of your test code and you can write additional modules for it. Uh, even if you want to write, uh, run those modules on your test machines. And this gets distributed dynamically uh, over network to your test machines and runs there. So I think that's everything. So these are some links uh, which you can check out. The mailing list itself is for uh, you know, discussions, which we don't use too much because most of our team is at Red Hat, but we are definitely monitoring it if you are interested in reaching out to us. The documentation is getting there because all of this is kind of new. So it's not completely, com uh, it's not complete, but it should help you out at least starting. And so it's all for me. Thank you, Andre, for your presentation, also for the live demo. Uh, we have some questions in the Q&A section. Shall I read them for you? Uh, I can start myself, I think, from the top. So Lukash uh, asks about, you mentioned virtual machines, how much configurable, configurable they are. Is it libvirt based or K8S or Kubernetes, or could you pass QMU command directly? So. Uh, the virtual machines are libvirt based and it's, uh, I think it could be extended. It, it doesn't do too much. It basically ju is just a very e simple wrapper that uh, creates the network between them. So we don't play around too much right now, but it could be an interesting idea to, to, to try out. We just haven't had the use case for it for ourselves. Next is anonymous. You mentioned this is somewhat risky to run on production network or something similar. Would you like? Would you be willing to go over this again? So, all of the network configuration requires uh, the uh, root permission. So the agent process or agent application that runs on your server uh, is something that is ex uh, exposed to your network. So the controller needs to connect to your uh, LNST agent. And the LNST agent is going to run root commands to configure your networks, but it also runs all of your other test, com uh, test commands and everything, basically. So the LNST agent does have very, very, very basic implementation of some uh, login credentials in there because somebody asked me, to, asked me to do this and I found it interesting, but it's not it's definitely not something that was properly security audited or anything. So anyone just can just connect to your agent, which gives you root permissions to the entire machine, which is the reason why this is not a good idea to run on anything that you care about. And Lukash again, you've mentioned you're not much fond of Bash. How are you actually configuring the system? Is it Ansible, custom Python, API, or shell commands? So it's split into two parts, the provisioning of the machines that you know sets up the actual OS system uh, is handled by Beaker internally at Red Hat, which does this part of the system. Uh, after that, we just do a very rudimentary configuration over uh, a couple of Beaker tasks, but that basically just installs uh, everything for us. And after that, uh, LNSD takes over. The network configuration is done by LNSD via uh, our LNSD devices package that connects over Netlink. And if we need to do anything else, we write, uh, we can write bash commands or shell commands directly in LNSD. So LNSD just takes care of that. And we typically want to create test modules that would wrap more complex procedures and do additional parsing on that so that it's a little bit more reliable. And there's a new question. So with the not run on anything you care about in mind, what exactly would the end user use, use, user case would look like? Well, right now we are the end user use case. Uh, internally at, at Red Hat, we have a private lab that is reserved for this. So this lab is isolated from everything. And that basically is good enough for us uh, because we don't expect anyone to attack that because it's not reachable. Uh, Additionally, uh, a kernel developer or a network developer would, it could be uh, an end user. Uh, 
again, with the idea that they have either they, they are either running the tests locally on virtual machines or containers, uh, which don't get exposed to a public network, or they have their own uh, machine hardware set up that they would be able to use for testing, which, again, if you're doing kernel network development, oftentimes many people do actually have those servers available for their testing. Thank you very much for your answers, Andre. This was our last question. I would like to thank you once again for your presentation. I would also like to thank to our audience for being here and for asking question it was very interesting uh, so thank you very much and if you want to contact Andre you'll see the contact info on the screen and we'll be back in uh, less than five minutes with the next presentation thank, thank you, you I'll, I will go to the work adventure thing if anyone wants to talk about a little bit more so see you